beautiful people and welcome to the RTS Futures. It's a thin master class. <laughs> Woo, people cheering from their homes, even though they're alone and very focused on getting good advice. <laughs> um, I'm Kima Bob. You might recognize me from the It's a Sin After Hours show. If you don't watch it, it's really good. And I'm not saying that because I'm in it. <laughs> Russell P stops by. It's very exciting. Um, and today we are joined by the writer and creator of It's a Sin, Mr. Russell T. Davies. Hello. Hello. We also have the executive producer of It's a Sin, Nicola Schindler. Hello. <laughs> and we have the Channel 4 commissioner, Lee Mason. Hello. Incredible. Look at Lee, looking thrilled to be here. He's so happy to be here today. <laughs> oh, that's what happens when you're a TV executive. Now, we're going to chat to these guys in a second about how this amazing series was brought to life from it being a tiny seed in Russell's mind to being the phenomenon that it is today. And we're gonna get some hot tips. That's right, I'm gonna make these guys spill the tea on how you can take a very real and very personal story and tell it on screen and have it be loved, you know? Cause don't we love it? But without wasting any more time, let's hop into it, my lovely panel. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Well, just changing lives and helping all of us be successful. Um, and I'm really excited because I know we have some aspiring writers and creators in the audience, but I too am trying to learn how to do these things. So I'm super excited and I want some good juicy answers, y'all, because I need to know. <laughs> okay. All right. Now that we got my assertive enthusiasm out of the way, <laughs> let's talk about the show, the beginnings, and how this thing came to be what it is. Russell, um, It's a Sin is personal in so many ways, be it one of those ways being that it's very much based on your youth in London, uh, the Pink Palace. The Pink Palace is a real place. Yeah. Um, uh, but also because this series very much has a mission, right? To bring light to this time and the victims of HIV. Um, now, when did the seed, the little acorn of this project first form in your mind? And also, when did you know that you had to tell this story? It's interesting, isn't it? It's like, uh, so much energy coming off your chemo. You should do every webinar ever. This is just already... <laughs> 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 Fuck oh, Kima. Um, but it's, it's, I can't find an exact moment because, of course, it was always there. I mean, almost every line in those five episodes was said to me. It's, it's probably the most real dialogue ever because every, everything comes from some conversation I had somewhere. So I was storing it up for 30 or 40 mm. years. And 40 years, that's 40 years of it piling up. And when that reached a tipping point, I don't, I mean, Nicola, can you remember when I first said it? Do you know, I did. I suddenly remember. Do you remember the screening, the massive screening we had for Cucumber in London? Oh, yes. And you, you went home that night. Yeah. I, yeah. We sat outside the screening and you, you, you talked about it before because we talked about HIV and AIDS when we, as, as early back as Queer as Folk, but yeah. it, it was something that was in your mind. But I remember you saying after Cucumber that it's now something you had to write about. And it wasn't yeah. what you wrote next, but I do remember that conversation. We were in some kind of big, a BFI place and, and we were talking outside the screening and I remember you saying that now you knew you had to write it. So I have no memory of that conversation. I only came to me. Oh, I, believe <laughs> I believe you. That's how it felt. I didn't know I told you that. Wow. And actually it should have been the thing I wrote next because then we got then it got turned down and then oh I did I went and did a Midsummer Night's Dream. But then then it got turned down. Then I did years and years and then I did English Candle. So it was it was I did start writing it then. And it's very much key it's like I do think Every piece of work leads to another piece of work. I did a thing called Cucumber for Channel 4 that's now on all four. You can watch that if you want to. And that's about a middle-aged man. And if you look at it, in the very last scene, he gives away what his problem is. And he's for eight hours of drama, heads towards the last line where someone basically says, what's wrong with you? And he just says, being gay. And that's it. And he's a middle-aged man. He lived through the 80s. It, it ticks, so it's underneath Cucumber all the time mm -hmm. and I literally kind of typed that last line of being gay a middle-aged man saying mm. my problem was being gay in this room actually I was in Swansea when I wrote that but um and and it that's what said was Nicholas saying that's what said to me right you have to write that show next the show that a middle-aged 
gay man who lived through that should write. You yeah. know? So it's, when was that? That's 2015. That must be Yeah, that conversation. Yes. But it's been a kind of undercurrent in there in some of your work and you're like let's bring it to the surface oh yeah yeah i did it i used to work on a children's show at granada called children's ward I used to produce that we did an hiv story in that in 1994 it's like it's always been ticking away in there so um you know it's part of my life you know it's it's, it's my friends it's my it's my community so um yeah but to actually it would always it always felt like an uphill task even before we discovered it, it was an uphill task to get it made, because we, I kind of we kind of knew it would be, didn't we, Nicola? I think that's what you were saying, which is yeah, like, like ah, now's the time I've got to write this now, because yeah. we had talked about it with queer as both, and and whether we show condoms when we're having sex, when not we were having sex, when the characters were having sex, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> when we're having sex, of course, yeah, obviously, yeah. <laughs> um, when we talked about that at real length, and, and we knew that there would be some backlash by not doing that, mm. and it was a very conscious decision to not put um, HIV in that story at all. So it had been around for twenty years, you know. Yeah. Well, the biggest moment in Queer as Folk is when he drives his jeep through a glass window, and that's because of an AIDS joke. Mm. That's why he does it. So it is there. It's always there. Um, it's funny. I did someone saw so someone the other day whose wife was a psychologist, and she says it takes. She said it takes thirty years to overcome trauma and process it. Uh. And she meant turn it into drama, which isn't true because there are plenty of writers out there talking about it much more immediately. And but I'm kind of glad it waited. I'm glad I got this. What's hard to describe, Kima, is that here we are with a successful show. Hooray! If I can yeah. say that, it is. But you don't know that back in 2015 or 2016 or 17 yeah. or Leo, any of us, we don't know that. If I could go back in time and pitch it, knowing what mm -hmm. the audience reaction would be. Yeah, yeah. I think we'd have got it made sooner because we didn't yeah. ever, did we Lee? We didn't ever have the nerve to sit there saying people will, now I'd go into an office and I'd go, people will be shocked by this. They will discover things they didn't know. People died and their lives were, their li their deaths were hidden and silenced and the young generation doesn't know this. And that we didn't do any of that because, mm. well, look, we're all liberal media people. We all kind of know the AIDS crisis and it well, genuinely kind of slipped out of our sight that most people don't. You know what I mean? Yeah, it, it it's yeah. tough to think about um, the headspace of someone who's completely not like you. Yeah. 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 I guess, uh, it's funny because you, you, you sit at every charity event, like every AIDS and HIV event, saying, Where is everyone? Why isn't everyone here? And you get used to saying that. And, and yeah. this transmitted, and you kind of realize, Oh, yeah, where is everyone? Where were you? Why didn't you see this happening? Yes. Um, but we didn't realize at the time that's not the attitude we went into making it with. Maybe that's good. Maybe we'd have come up with a much more militant piece of work and, and, mm. and I think the fact that the show isn't, it's an angry show. It's not militant. I wouldn't call it a militant mm. drama. So maybe it's, who knows? Maybe it all worked out for the best that way. Mm. Um, yeah, interesting. It's lovely. Um, I, I'm so glad that you decided to bring it up to the surface. Yes. And now you weren't like weaving it in in sneaky ways. You were like, bam, 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 <laughs> and a montage. <laughs> <laughs> and lots of beautiful booties. Um, <laughs> but we don't need to talk about what I loved the most. Um, <laughs> Nicola and Russell, you guys have obviously collaborated and have been working together for a while. And we'll get to that later. But Nicola, uh, you got involved after you guys had that chat. Yeah, so actually Russell wrote a script quite a while ago, um, mm. it, before we did Years and Years, and I'd, I'd forgotten about, sorry, <laughs> A Midsummer Night's Dream, so it was quite Thank a few years ago. But so, so that script was there, and that script, we were trying to sell that script, and, and we ended talking to, to Lee, but there was lots of processes yeah. along the way. Um, so what did, you, um, what did you need to do before it could be brought to Lee in the channel? Do you know, it didn't change really from what Russell wrote, first of all. That's what's really interesting. Often on, in television, I find this so much when a script's really good, it finds the right time. So the scripts yeah. that I've had that have been, you know, 
one script I know had been rejected four times, twice by the BBC, twice by ITV, until without a word changing, it got made into a series and it's now on its fifth series. So it's just, it's about the right time. This was a different process because it's such a specific subject matter, but it remained the script Russell wanted to write. And it was about finding the commissioner who understood that and who was, you know, who understood what Russell was trying to write and the tone of it and how watchable it was. Because I think people were scared of it, but we were just very lucky to, to find Lee <laughs> and, you know, in the right place at the right time. And he understood what, what Russell was trying to do. Do you think they were scared of it? Or yeah, of course. I think to, you say to someone, I'm going to put on... Now, if you say I'm going to do a COVID drama, people's heart kind of sinks because you think I don't... Oh, want to yes. I, and and when, if you say I'm going to do an HIV AIDS drama, it feels like it's going to be about death, about victims, about very thin men in beds dying, which is all we've ever seen before. And that's because I think people couldn't see beyond that and couldn't see the joy that you'd written into it mm. until Lee. <laughs> now, Lee, you incredible bearded man <laughs> there's a there's another remarkable story from russell about you keeping the script in your desk until the right time uh, to pitch it to your new boss now clearly you really believed in it um but why do you feel yeah like why do you feel like it was the perfect time to get that green light um I, I mean, and, and, and you know, it, it, it is sort of true. It's not, it, you know, it, it kind of was in my sort of desk drawer, and sometimes it was on the top of my desk. And in fact, I haven't been back in the office for every year because of COVID and lockdowns. But I'm pretty sure if you go to my desk now, Still that, there. that script is on that desk. It's got a couple of <laughs> rings on it and things like that. But <laughs> yeah, and I'm pretty sure that script is really not very different to what was shot. It's just not, is it? No, I mean, it's, no it's exactly the same. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I think it was, it, it, in terms of the time, you know, I mean, it, I mean, uh, Piers Wenger, who was head of drama, the sort of the, the first time that the script came to Channel 4, I mean, he loved it and he really, absolutely, you know, he loved it as much as I did. And, you know, he sort of desperately would have wanted to make it at Channel 4 as well. But, you know, there's all sorts of reasons why things don't get made at certain times and, and all, 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 all that sort of stuff. And I think, you know, as, as, as Nicola was saying, you know, it doesn't sound like a ratings, you know, <laughs> ratings dynamite when you say we want to make a drama about AIDS because ultimately that's a show about people dying. And so, you know, there's lots of reasons why you, you can sort of see why people wouldn't want to make that. Um, yeah. But I just, I just, I just, I, I fell in love with it. I loved it. I think because I'm a gay man, it makes a difference. Uh, you know, I think it, it says something that the two of the two commissioners that tried their hardest to get it commissioned, you know, <laughs> there were gay men that were trying to do it because it was a story yeah. that they absolutely sort of connected to instead of their sort of cultural history. Um, and it was just, it, it was there. And it was just always there. And I'd, I'd, you know, I would kind of, I'd hear that maybe there was a conversation with the BBC and, I'd, and, I, and I used to genuinely hope that it would get green lit. I didn't care if it got green lit somewhere else. I just desperately One wanted this to, to, to be made because one, this story hadn't been told from a British perspective. I remember years before when I was working for a production company and pitching the uh, the collected, uh, the Oscar Moore PWA articles as a book. And I pitched them to Channel 4 years and years and years ago. And they said, yeah, we just feel that's been done. Yeah. You know, and I thought, no, it hasn't. Philadelphia has been done. <laughs> this movie has been done. That great play has been done. But the British story, the experience of young British men in this country and how we as a country reacted to that has, has, has not been covered. So I just it, it just felt like it had to be made. And so, you know, you just you get a thing, don't you? And it's kind of with you and, it, and, it, and it, you just desperately, desperately want to do it. Mm. Ian Katz turned up. He was the new director of programmes, um, you know, I hope you won't mind saying this, but he was he was kind of new to that job. His background was journalism. He'd worked at Newsnight. Um, and I think, you know, I went in there and I pitched it and I pitched it pretty hard and I pitched it from a journalistic point of view. This is worth everyone thinking about this, about how you pitch stuff to everyone, really. Um, he's a journalist. So I, I pitched it with a slight journalistic take. Um, and, 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 you know, and that was something he really connected with, that, that this wasn't a story that had been told properly. Um, oh. And it was Russell, and you know everybody wants to yeah. work with Russell. So it 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 actually it, the, the the sitting and waiting was kind of the hard bit, which was just frustrating that you know I, we, we, it took that long. But once he sort of read it and, and got it, it was it was a very quick green light actually. Mm, it was. Very quick. Yeah. That is so cool. 
That is so cool. And what a what a brilliant guy you are. What? Oh, what? I didn't know I was on with three geniuses. This is blowing my mind. Okay, <laughs> we got to move on. Uh, now, <laughs> Russell and Nicola, once you guys got the green light, what were the next steps? And please do tell me how you were able to secure such an amazing cast. Okay, you have music superstar Ollie playing the lead. I mean, did y'all see that Brits performance? I know. Hello. <laughs> um, and you have Hollywood stars making appearances. Okay, I mean, actual NPH, <laughs> actual Stephen Fry, but this amazing new talent as well. Some folks fresh out of drama school. Like, how did you secure this? What did y'all do once you got that green light? Well, Nicola, go on. Well, the casting didn't come straight away because Russell had to write the scripts. So once we once we had the scripts and once we understood who those characters were, we didn't have all of them when we talked to Ollie. We had the conversation that has now been had nationally and, and people keep saying Russell's T Davies says. But we had the conversation that, that this should be a, a primarily gay cast playing gay cast playing gay roles. And that that was really important for the tone and the feel of this particular show. And once we had that conversation, then we looked at who who is there for, for that part for Richie. We, we talked about do we need a star? Should we have a total newcomer? And and. I can't remember how Russell's name came up. And, uh, Ollie's name came up. I know it's from you, Russell, and I know we looked at him as a performer and, and his... Well, energy. he was kind of a list of one or two of yeah. I mean, that age, that talented, that, and we auditioned him. Yeah. Um, you know, we little did we know how brilliant he was, um, so we still auditioned him. But, but you want someone... I mean, you know, it helps to have someone famous in a lead role. There aren't many young, out, gay, famous young men in fact there's probably only yeah. him um and that he's was just that, done speech, he, he, he'd just done his glastonbury speech which was so extraordinary about identity and about his himself as a gay man and just yeah. he, he was inspirational even in that speech you kind of saw this you saw the intelligence yeah. and the passion in him really early on i've got to say if we'd audition him and that hadn't worked i mean at channel four we'd we'd have stood a very good chance of going to lee and say look we're going to cast a newcomer because, and that's, that's also why you get Neil Patrick Harris, you get Keeley, uh -huh. yeah. you get Sean Dooley. It's like, little did we know, again, it's all hindsight. We don't know how good our young cast is going to be. Mm -hmm. So right from the beginning, we're backing them up with absolute um, publicity, you know, it's, it just works. They, we thought that would be the publicity. Everyone want Keely Hawes, everyone that. Little did we know that the world would go Lydia West mad and Callum and Nathaniel and Omari, all of them. So it just... Yes. But all of them were auditioned. None of them were offers, apart from yeah. obviously Stephen and Keely and um, yeah. you know, the, old, the elder generation were offers. But all those young people we auditioned. And Ollie, we like had uh, in a tiny room, me, Russell and Andy Pryor, the casting director, he sat really, really close to us, no, read it once. And we all kind of like, there was just like, was what, that how, yeah, there was a total and utter buzz. And he's, he's so delightful as well. So being yeah. in a room with him and you could see how joyous he was about the material. It just felt like, oh, this is the beginning of something special. And he's so politically wise as well. That's right. He came in knowing his HIV history and that's rare. You, you don't mm -hmm. have to do that. But my God, I literally wanted to run after him towards the lift. Say, yeah, he but, said, but you can't. We have to phone up Lee and we have to phone yeah. up everyone saying, we'd like to offer him. And I was going, oh, let's do it now. I think, um, I think, I think it was pretty quick, though. I think yeah, you know, oh God, that, yes. that with the link and it was like, yep, great, done. You know, there, wasn't, there wasn't any discussion about it. And it is. It's what Nicholas is saying about the right time. It's like it was the right time for him. Musically, he, he was on kind of on a pause and he was committed to it. It's just. Luck in the end, isn't it? Luck. Incredible. That's our tip. Be lucky. <laughs> That's it. It's Incredible. Like, wow. We're lucky as viewers. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and I don't know how important attractiveness was in the casting process, but you achieved that as well. And as a pansexual cutie, I was having the time of my life. <laughs> <laughs> and the cast was so lovely. They're attractive, but not necessarily in a conventional, like Hollywood way. I think that's yeah. what makes them great as a team, which mm. is they are just beautiful human beings and they're very yeah. talented and they're good fun. And so they're just yeah. they're gorgeous in that respect. And also we're doing that's this whole it. thing. It's, it's an inside out gorgeous. Yeah. We have to meet our casting director, Andy Pryor, who mm -hmm. is just we've worked with uh, I did Doctor Who with him as well and it's just he just knows where Callum for example mm -hmm. Colin, was still at college in Welsh College yes he'd come, he'd come and film with us he's only 22 now so he's 20 at the time he's like 10 years yeah. younger than Ollie but it's lucky 
And so Andy, it's his, Andy's job, but he goes out there, he goes to the colleges, he goes to the end of year shows, we'd seen Callum. So Callum would film with us, go back to college, film with us, go back to college. Amazing, what a boy, amazing. Instead, it was his first like big job, like what? Yeah, I know, look at him. What? I know. Incredible. It's brilliant. Huh. Now, I've gone on and on about how sexy the show is, and you've been praised for the style, um, exemplified in the brilliant AIDS denial montage. Uh, I want to quickly take a look at that again and discuss how we came to that aesthetic. But before I do, just a heads up to everybody at home, there's a bit of strong language and some sexual content, obviously. <laughs> Please play that clip, tech people. It's not fair. Every time we go out, it's this shit. The whole thing is a pack of lies. No, but that man, Pete, he said he met this man who said he was... Oh, he said, she said, they said. They're always saying something. But do you want to know the truth? Do you know what it really is, AIDS? It's a racket. It's a money-making scheme for drugs companies. Do you seriously think there's an illness that only kills gay men? It can calculate that you're gay and kill you, but no one else. Hmm. What about bisexuals? Do they only get sick every other day? And they say it's a cancer, but you can't catch cancer. Cancer is not a thing that can get caught. It's not like a cold or a cough. Is cancer. It doesn't transmit. Because imagine it. Gay cancer. How is a cancer gay? I mean, what does it look like? Is it pink? Where is it? Is it in the wrist? I mean, for God's sake. You get all these stories and all these rumors and all these nightmares. Because that's what they want you to think that lot. They want to scare us and stop us having sex and make us really boring, basically because they can't get laid. That's the truth. Because according to them, how does it work with AIDS thing? Okay. They say it's spread by poppers. They say it arrived from outer space on a comet. And they say that God created it to strike us dead. They say it was created in a laboratory to kill us. They say it's the Russians. They say we got it from the jungle. They say it's caused by friction. They say it's in the spunk. They say Freddie Laker spread it when he introduced cheap flights. They say there's one patient zero spreading it wherever he goes. They say it affects homosexuals, patients, and hemophilia. Like, there's a disease which has targeted the letter H. Who's it going to get next? People from Hartlepool and Hampshire and Hull. Don't you see what all of these things have got in common? They're not true! And how do I know? How do I know it's not true? Because I'm not stupid! Which means... Every drama should have that, really, don't you think? Most videos do. <laughs> mandatory, I say. <laughs> I think it should be mandatory for animated films. <laughs> Enough of those animals. <laughs> um, <laughs> how did you oh. guys agree on that aesthetic? Mind you, it's so strong. And that scene, it's the most beautiful um like lighting right and shots the pace of it as well it's the sexiest montage with the most ridiculous dialogue that makes so much sense but you just, the whole time you're watching it you're like this is gorgeous but richie what are you saying <laughs> <laughs> how did you guys come to that aesthetic well, it's I mean, it's as written, really. It's 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 written like that. It, it it and that is we should have our director Peter Hall here and our DOP David Katz Nelson because it's written like that. But then that is two people grabbing something and absolutely making it work. Is that I mean, you loved that, didn't you, Nicola? You were so absolutely proud of loved it. And I said to Russell as well because Russell's written massive moments like that in loads of things that I've worked on. And, and that, you know, and it's about timing and it's very musical and it, mm -hmm. it's all about the right cut. And often they have been done very well, but not 
quite as amazing as when you read them. Yeah. And when you when you watch that, Peter, the director, had absolutely got it, and he understood the rhythm of it, and he understood the timing, and he understood what it needed to be. So I was just so excited. From I mean, the first, the most beautifully realised of your ambitious pieces that I've worked on. Mm. Yes, yeah, and he pushed it further. That yeah. friction by shaking the table, and and we all did. Is that the very last thing? The episode had been locked and finished and done. Uh, when we added that Hartley Pool and Hull and Haemophiliacs, and I added that, I don't know, because it just, it, the energy dipped slightly as they were walking down the street and talking. It wasn't mm. it'd been mm -hmm. so busy. You just had the curtains and the airline steward and everything, and then suddenly it just became the street talking. So when the whole thing was locked, I just said, hello, have we got a thousand pounds, please? Just to, and then that was a job of work, choosing the right font, choosing the right colour. And so everyone, we were all chipping into that and piling in and, and the and song that, had to change. That wasn't the original song. No, that wasn't the song. So it, was, it was written to another song, but it worked. we found a song wow. that worked along the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We couldn't get the rights to that song. I, I think, yeah. And I think, you know, I, I make, honestly, I mean, it, it, as, as a commissioner, I mean, honestly, it, my, my contribution was minimal once it was greenlit. But it, but because I remember there was there was one conversation about the look of the style and the feel of it, and it was just everyone just knew what they were doing. It was so clear, and there was just this one thing that we all agreed on. I remember which you know, Ch Channel Four. Channel Four is a young channel, you know. Channel Four doesn't really do period drama. You're not going to get down to now be on Channel Four. I mean, you might do, but certainly you know, one day, but certainly not at the moment. Um, and you know, I remember we all sort of said, you know, it's it's a period piece, but it's not heritage television. It has to feel young, it has to feel contemporary, it has to feel like it relates and you know, sort of communicates with the audience that we, you know, we were sort of wanting to watch. Because the thing with Channel 4 is, you know, it's great that I watched it. I'm the generation that sort of remembers all of that. But actually, you know, the real, the real success of the show is the young people who watched it. I just fell in love with it and it became such a kind of sort of education for them. That's the thing. And, and it, it, that, it, it, it never felt like a period piece to me, even though the accuracy of it is incredible mm -hmm. um but it just did the, the, the energy of it felt like something that it just felt like you were in the moment now rather than watching something you know old-fashioned or something back in the day as it were and it's funny because it's it's like it's that sequence it's not it's not just a sequence it's not just us having fun it's 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 the entire reason i wanted to write the show i mean there are lots of reasons so there are lots of sequences but that's a key one that's me in 2015 or 2010 sitting there going I want to dramatise that period of time when it was all rumours, where people didn't believe it, where they said it had come from out of space, where they said God had struck us down, where it was impossible that a virus could be gay and could be passed on. I'd never seen that dramatised anywhere. And that, that's all very interesting. But then you think, well, how do I dramatise that? It's a bunch of people sitting in the pub saying, some people are saying it's sent by God. Well, I don't think that's true. Bah, that's it. So you've got to, I mean, that's the tip, if anything. It's like if you're faced with something face with something vital but boring you've got to lift it, it, it that yeah. whole sequence would have died if it had been pub yeah. dialogue or an argument between three friends oh my gosh the Ollie it, giving a speech so yes it has to, to lift yeah. itself up so it's like i always say yeah yeah <laughs> this is in this room and type and it's like that's why it's knackering because it's like you have to play that music and you have to make everything lift and keep lifting all the way through production, all the way through, and all the way through the edit. Just keep lifting stuff, otherwise. Yeah, it's really interesting yeah. with with that speech because I tell you, in other hands, when you'd have received that script, you'd have had that. You'd gone, that's a really long, boring list. Can we cut that down? Can yes. we cut it down? And actually, it's the scene that gets played the most. It's the one that is traveled the most and it's just so iconic and so brilliant. You know, it's about, it's just sort of Russell's kind of genius about sort of the sort of counterintuitive kind of, it's about that, but how do you kind of sort of, you know, sort of reposition that and kind of, you know, bringing a different kind of energy or attitude to it. Just, and then it becomes one of the most famous scenes of the whole show, you know. It's also what makes Russell's work the hardest to produce. Because <laughs> if, if yeah. only had been stood behind a podium, <laughs> that's one thing. That's <laughs> so many shots in so yeah. many locations and so much searching for the right archive. We, we really look for the right archive. And we also should say a brilliant editor as well, because the editor, Sarah Bruton, who understood yeah absolutely what we we're trying to do but yeah. that's hard for that production team oh. there were so many different elements to it and and you know that's filmed in so many different locations and it has to feel like a continuous night and it's that barely changes from their first cut did it it's that's nope. sarah and peter together that is that is i can't think what changed in that if anything we added things like the graphics but that's their first cut it's amazing can yeah. i ask 
um, if you recall, because you were saying it was written that way, it was written to look that way. Do you remember what any of uh, those, you know, any of that was written like, what any of that description was like? Literally shot by shot, literally. I mean, very fast. I mean, if a, if a scene is, if a sequence is fast, it should look fast on the page. So mm. that's when your stage directions need to go to, uh, literally, there's a stage direction saying, spunk flies through the air bang like that not you know and you don't do a stage direction saying gracefully slowly a beautiful yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, piece of semen flies through the air majestically that's when that's when you can't do that. that's when you cut out adverbs out of a script cut out you barely even have full stops you start going dash dash, dash. it's like the, the look yeah. of it on the page should look like how it feels it's just if the scene is very slow and very sonorous and very solemn then you can have big blocks of stage directions and big speeches that's what it looks dense it's like you know but you know you turn a page on a novel and they haven't paragraphed much like it's Solzhenitsyn or something and you go oh like <laughs> it's like put some paragraphs in please and um, I think all writing should put more paragraphs in so when you get a sequence like that it's bang 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 on the page it's probably about yeah. four pages long Michael, or something yeah, like, and, yeah. It's so good. and it's the, the writing's so detailed that the, the my favorite guy in the whole thing the air hostess who blows the kiss to the screen. That casting is so brilliantly important. Great, his name everyone is, yeah. knew who it should be. Because yeah. Yeah. He, Russell hadn't written, he has a moustache and he does it joyfully, but Andy knew exactly who to present to us. Peter knew who he wanted. And we all saw it and just went, yes, please. So it's because <laughs> yeah. of the writing is so clear. You you know, you could everything it's follows. Long as, it's technically, every moment has a scene break. It's not just, it's not just boy spunk kiss action yeah. it says there's you need to spell it out you know as Nicola always says a, a script is the document that everyone on the production needs to yeah make the show so it's not it's not just it's not just a list of stage directions everything has a scene right everything says cut to airplane cut to street cut to yeah. car cut to it's all delineated like that incredible honestly and like watching it back you can't help but like groove along so were you writing to the music yeah, and we had to change the song in the end, but weird, isn't it? Same effect. Yes, I had one track that I just played. I always do that. I just played a thousand times on, on that sequence. Yeah. yeah, yeah Did yeah. you create a playlist while uh, writing? I do, yes. I, I, I forget what they are then, but yeah, yeah, yeah. And yes, and I I, I do it manually because I'm always hopping about and scene, so I play whatever. A lot of it was just 80s chart hits. That had a very specific tune, but yeah, just 80s. So cool. And one more question before we move on is, are any of these scripts available online? They are not. They should be, you know. Um, Exciting. I was wondering, because I feel like we've been talking about the sequence and some people might want to take a look. It's brilliant. Can you put um, Channel 4 script in the BBC say, writer's yeah, room? I don't know, because we normally use the writer's... I've always put scripts on the writer's room, but I'm not Channel 4 script, so... Is there any? Is there anywhere on the Channel Four website we could do it, Lee? Um, I think there might be. Let me check. Can we give them to the writers' room now that the program is transmitted? I'd love to do that because no. they use the resources really well there. Yeah. Yes. I mean, you go to the writers' room to look for scripts. So anyway, yes, we'll try. Thank you, everyone. So, guys, um, this show was a huge hit domestically on Channel 4 and very well received, but a few weeks later it traveled to the US with HBO Max and oh my gosh, the wave. It was like you got one wave and you're like, that's a big wave. <laughs> then you catch that next wave and you're like, tsunami. Um, <laughs> it was so well received. It was so lovely. Um, but this was a very particular story about the experience of gay men in Britain. Why, what do you think uh, made it resonate in other countries? And this is a question for all three of you gorgeous people. I think the story is universal. I think that's, I think when you, when you land on something which is, is emotionally universal, then it sells really well. It's not about whether characters travel to France and Germany and come back to England, which some people think is international drama. Anything I've ever done that's sold well. <laughs> is when, is when it's, it's, it's absolutely truthful to those characters and those people. So, yeah, and it wasn't just America, actually. It weirdly sold everywhere in advance, which it's things just so, don't do. Mad, Before it went out, it had sold all over the world, yeah. which is, you know, which does say something about Russell's imagination. It, it did absolutely capture people wherever they were. There was, there, there's something about it that just had, it, 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 again, it, it goes against what people expect it to be, <clears throat> which mm -hmm. is that people think it's a show about 
AIDS and therefore sad stories of people dying, which of course that that that, that is true. You but do just, cry. But, but oh, you cry a lot. But, but you laugh. But, but it's such a sort of celebration of life, and therefore I think it's so unexpected that this that this show and this subject makes you feel like that. That it's something that people just feel they have to share with other people. There was a real kind of I mean, look, I, I think the marketing that we did for the show was absolutely incredible. Yes, that's but, right. Yeah, yeah. But, I actually, but a lot of it was really to do with people on social media and people telling their friends. And it just became this thing that built really, really, really quickly because I think people just were so, were so surprised by how they felt about it. And I think that it's just, you know, and, and I think, you know, the, the, it's, the universality of it is it's about family, you know, it's about a family and it doesn't matter where, what your family looks like, that idea that you will have people that you love, you would lose loved ones, secrets that you keep from each other, and all those sorts of things that we have in sort of family dramas, that it's all in that pink palace. It's all with those group of people and their relationships with each other or people outside of that building. And I think in many, many ways, we can all relate to one of those characters and one of their sort of stories with their families or siblings or whatever. I mean, they just... And it's amazing, you know, great drama gets watched, you know, most of the time. <laughs> um, you know. It's not too shabby at all, is it? <laughs> so we were lucky as well that the commissioners at HBO Max came on board really early on. They came they on board with one it. script and they got yeah. it immediately. Yeah, it what, is that, what is that process like? Because you speak to, do you speak to Channel 4 first? And the, does Channel 4 say... I'm willing to share. <laughs> what is that like? We had a kind of pincer movement. So we were working with all three media who were selling it internationally. And they said to uh, me and Russell, would we meet with the HBO execs in Edinburgh, where we were doing um, some blah, blah talk. Um, <laughs> and we met. And then Lee and Caroline from Channel 4 were meeting the same people from HBO Max the following week. So I'd said, oh. we've met them. It's gone really well. Can you can you say nice things as well? No, it wasn't, we, we, actually, we met them 20 minutes after you. In oh, Edinburgh. Right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And then by the, by the end of that day, almost, if not the next day, they yeah, said, we're really interested. We want to make an offer. That was nice. Wow. And I, I think, you know, you, you're absolutely right that, that both, both the, the commissioners sort of bought Channel 4 and HBO Max. I think they just have the same sort of shared vision for it and the same audience for it, I think, that, that they were wanting. Because, you know, if, if I'm really honest, you know, my, my priority is Channel 4. My priority is the British audience that are coming to watch it. So, you know, yes, you want to make sure that everyone involved is sort of happy. But ultimately, you know, if HBO had asked for something that I hated, I would have said, I don't really care what HBO thinks. This is what I want for Channel 4. And then it's up to Nicola to try and keep everyone happy. But <laughs> I, don't, I, I didn't think that happened on this show. I think, you know, well, maybe there was stuff and I don't know about that. There, there was moments about lines, but really, really small. And always when we went back and explained either what the line means or yeah. why it had to stay that way, they were, they were great. The big crisis yeah. was actually music because uh, yeah. that's when all three media and HBO Max stepped up to the plate, actually, because yeah. uh, Peter, our director, added a lot more music that was in the script, and he edited it brilliantly. And that was one of the most successful things about the show. People loved the track. Oh, yeah. Music really costs, and we had to turn around and say, if you want this music, someone's going to have to copy. Because we can use the music on Channel 4 without paying. We, we pay a fee, but we don't pay the international clearance. Uh -huh. And we were expecting to have to take that music off because we couldn't afford it. It was £130,000 to... To, to play the music. Well, why the didn't you guys ask me? I would have lent it to you. <laughs> <laughs> it is. But no, I, I remember because the, the songs that play over the credits at the end of each episode, they're very particular to that episode. Yeah. Which mm -hmm. are so amazing. You know, I mean, you sort of, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that someone else was able to pay for them. <laughs> we, um, did, we did lose, we still lost a lot. We had to play some stuff. I know. Here I the know. End. When uh, Roscoe first meets Colin, there's actually stock music playing, which makes my heart. Dice. No, I don't, you know, it, 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 it doesn't happen so much now, but back in the day, do you remember when everything would go out on DVD? Go and on, suddenly yeah. all, it would all just be kind of like library tracks and all the songs. <laughs> We'd have two versions then. You'd have a, trans, a broadcast version and the DVD version. Yeah. Hey, queer as folks like that. I think. Yeah, it is. It's horrible. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I want to ask you guys is there any key advice that you can give um, aspiring writers, creators, when it comes to creating? A drama that can travel and you said before i just want to bring it back around um was it universality is it about specificity the truth like what what one last time for the kids well from my point of view i didn't think about selling it to america or to germany or to israel at all 
I mean, there's nothing. They could have had an American flatmate. They could have had an Italian flatmate. And there was just no need. I mean, it's so specific. I mean, it's so British. There's literally an Englishman, a Welshman, a Scotsman in there. And um, and it's my experience. It, 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 you know, there are jokes about Larry Grayson and things like that. There are jokes about people that, that no American will ever get. But And they did questions on those lines when we just said, you know, it's no different to us watching it. I watch American sitcoms. They're always referring to Gilligan's Island. They refer to Gilligan's Island so much that I know what Gilligan's Island is. <laughs> it's like, and you just you just go with it though, because you just know oh, it's an American joke. And um, so it, as you said, you just apps to, to be universal. It's absolutely specific. Yeah, and that is it's the only not way. It's the writer's to... job. That's the truth. If the writer should not have that in their mind. If the writer's thinking, how am I selling this internationally? They're thinking about uh -huh. the wrong things. Yeah, the writer has to think, yeah. what's the best version of the script I can write? Who's the best character I can put on screen? How does the story, how is the story told in the best way? Not will someone in Idaho be able to understand it? Because that would be just the death of it. And I, I think also as well, you know, because we're living in this sort of global streaming world, you know, audiences are just a bit more sophisticated. Well, actually, they always yeah. were. We just we just didn't realize they were. Or we didn't make yeah. stuff for them in that way. That you don't all, you know, you, you, you know, you know, sometimes it's it's fine. People get it. I mean, another amazing show that Nicola produced, Happy Valley, you know, that did great, didn't it? On, on, on Netflix. I mean, that is a show set in the north and there is no denying that is a very specific show and it comes from it's got it's got all the flavors of a certain region of this country didn't bother audiences outside of the uk because it's an amazing story with amazing characters at the heart of it going on these big emotional journeys which you can just be just so engaging and i love it now it's called mayor of east town <laughs> No, it doesn't sound like. I haven't seen it. Uh, well, you're going to enjoy it. <laughs> no. I don't know what just happened. <laughs> that was I'm a not little... going to try to find no. out. We'll, we'll all be arrested. Gonna... You know, we'll yeah, all be... I know. Don't sue. Well. Don't sue. I don't sue you. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it is. Um, I'm, I'm looking here to try to save some time and I want to ask you two questions, yeah? And you can answer whichever one you fancy and we'll have a little from Russell, a little from Nicola, a little from Lee so then we can move on to the Q&A. So two questions. Ah, uh, pick your fave. One, what does it take to get to this point to where you are trusted to make such a personal project? And I guess I don't mean your CV, but I feel like part of it is your CV. Um, second question, this is a fun one, and I need to know this because I'm currently writing a show about my relationship with my ridiculous mother. Yeah. What do writers need to keep in mind when it comes to protecting real people and yourself? So what does it take to be trusted to make such a personal project? Maybe Lee, you'll have some insight as the guy who was like, actually, let's make this. And what do writers need to keep in mind when it comes to protecting themselves and the people they write about? Well, it does help if you're probably, you know, one of the greatest TV writers that we've ever had in this country. That probably does help. I A little like, bit. One of. One of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> one of. <laughs> But I, I, I think, you know, I, I tell you, one of the most important thing, thing for writers is always to make sure, and it's really hard when you're sort of starting out and you want people to take your projects and you're just so grateful when another producer says, I love what you do and I want to work with you and all that sort of stuff. That relationship between writer and producer is absolutely key because if you, if you don't have Russell CV and you're coming to me and you've got this great idea and a great show, and you know, I read, you know, and, and we, we work a lot with new writers. I'm working with a writer at the moment. This will be his first original sort of uh, uh, drama commission. But knowing that that relationship is there with the producer, knowing that there's a trust there, knowing that that producer is invested in the show and you as much as you are in that, it's all about reassurance. It's all about reassurance because, you know, there, there, there is a moment. When you're just about to green light and you know you sort of you're kind of handing the check over going yeah make this show here's these millions of pounds to make this show and you need to trust we believe in you yeah you know you could have this no no um but you know but you are kind of looking behind the writer's shoulder at the producer gonna go you're, you're gonna deliver this right you're gonna be there all the time you're gonna support it and i think it's 
that that the relationship between the writer and producer is so 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 important uh, that that will make a difference that will that that's where the trust comes from it's not just about the writer it's about who else is bringing that project with you actually brilliant wow yeah. some insight my man is going like boop, boop. um russell any tips as far as protecting yourself and protecting others like for example um jill jill nader yeah Nolder, yeah, Nolder, yeah. Nolder. Nolder. Um, there's an L. <laughs> um, yeah, Jill Nolder, who we saw Lydia West portraying a version of Jill, but that that's a real person. And you say that a lot of conversations and characters are pulled from life. Um, yeah, how do you how do you protect those people while taking inspiration from them? I think it's just um, it's partly common sense. I'm not I'm not displaying any of them as a murderer, or a, a, that's where you get in trouble. Bear in mind also, any piece of television will go through endless layers of compliance. When the BBC falls off air, when Channel 4 falls off air, it'll be because of their news departments, not because of their drama departments. Because it's the news departments who will release something and say, we don't do compliance, and they and suddenly there are lawsuits and everything, everything because their drama has to go through endless, endless, endless compliance. And that's why drama very rarely legally gets in trouble, um, and, you know, you could equally have a meeting with us where we say that compliance drives us mad, but it does actually protect all of us and protect people yeah. we're writing about. And yeah. I've done true life things like, you know, the a very English scandal about Jeremy Thorpe and Norman Scott. Norman Scott's still alive. And, you know, I do, I do imagine things he was saying and doing, but, um, you know, you've got to be a grown up if you're writing it to attack someone, uh, just purely to attack, attack someone, then um, have a word with yourself because you've got to, although there are very good dramas that can do that, um, um, just rest assured you're not alone and write from the heart, right? And and just keep it turning. Don't just don't just have one reason to write something. Don't say, I'm going to expose this person. I'm going to create, because whatever you're creating on the screen isn't going to be that person. It's going to be a fictionalized version that's got, totally. more, that's got more of you in it than them, I suspect. So that saves it at the same time. It's, um, it's about talking about the thing that Lee was talking about, giving tips about, uh, you know, is a writer going to deliver? I find myself giving this advice more and more often to young writers, which is uh, sort yourself out as well. If you're one of those writers, yeah. I'm always late. I'm always late. I always deliver late. Oh my God, I'm always late. Sort yourself out. Don't yeah. deliver late because there are people who have careers like that and they don't last. Also, if you drink too much, it's like seriously, yeah. sort yeah. there are writers who drink too much and they might they might be yeah. talk of the town for 10 years. Don't, don't make it to 20 years. It's like, really, yeah. I'm not, all writers have to be a bit mad. You'll never get rid of all your madnesses. But if there are things in your psyche that stop you delivering scripts, it's not going to work. And that's a fact, because yeah. it's very hard work. And if Ooh. the booze or your habits or your life are stopping you delivering, you're not going to do it. You won't. And there's, yeah. a, there's, an, and there's another part to that as well. I have loads of scripts coming in all the time. So I can be really excited about this. When I when I commission that script for you to write that script, I can be really, really excited about it. The longer it takes for that script to come back to me, yeah. I might start to lose interest. Or something else has come on my desk, and suddenly that's the 10 o'clock show that I want to pitch to Ian Katz. It's not the one that I thought I was going to be pitching. So Because yeah. I'm scheduling myself. I think, okay, I've commissioned that script. That's going to come to me that, around about that time of the year. It starts sort of you know, disappearing. There's a, and then there's a little bit where you go, oh God, is it ever going to come? Maybe it's never going to come. Mm -hmm. you know? Now look, there's loads of reasons why those things can happen. It's not everyone's fault. Sometimes personal things yeah. get in the way, but um, it, it, it is absolutely, Russell's absolutely right. And if you've got an agent who says yes to everything and gets you to have loads of things in paid development at the same time and you can't deliver everything, yeah, you've got bad agents. Yes, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Wow. That, uh, honestly, I'll... Uh, uh, Throwing quickly that as a comic uh, and a writer, I'm in an industry where a lot of people feel like you have to be dysfunctional to make your art. And it's yeah. not the case. It holds you down. And I started sorting myself out a few years ago and everything else has just started to flow, gang. Oh, um, really, yeah. really. That's it. I mean, you'll always be a bit dysfunctional. It's not, we're not, of course. We're not normal. I'm but... kooky as all hell, but that's <laughs> all right. Yeah, I invented this. <laughs> No, not at all. Nobody has. The fact that my hair and couch match perfectly is not strange. Not strange. It makes sense. Um, gorgeous. 
I want to move on to the Q and A now and see what our lovely audience want to know. Oh, we've got a question from Aaron Daniels. What a great name. Russell, you mentioned that if you could go back and pitch It's a Sin to yourself, knowing the reaction it has received, that it probably would have been made sooner. <laughs> um, what I want to know is how do you know when, when it's the right time to write or submit a script? Um, because who knows if something would get the same reaction being released five years ago as it would be being released today. Well, you, the case? Hmm? You, you simply don't. You just have to blunder on. There's no way I'd sit at my desk going, maybe this will be right in five years' time. Um, and so you keep it. It's, it's, there's no control over that. This is all hindsight. Talks like this are hindsight. And there are plenty of shows that were on last year, plenty of shows we've made that haven't quite worked. Maybe they were the wrong time, or maybe maybe they were the right time. Maybe they just didn't work. Um, yeah. So it's much more of a lottery than that. There's no there's no wisdom I can give it to that, do you think? And it's your producer's job to to think about, oh, that person's literally, this is how cynical, that person's changed jobs. So there's someone now who hasn't seen it, and I still think yeah. it would work for that channel. I'm going to show it to that channel again. And that's how things get made that have been rejected, not because the project changes. So if, if you feel the script is good enough and as good as you can write, then that's the right time to release it. Don't think tactically. Yeah, and also, you know, the, the commissioners are commissioners are human beings. They have their own taste, their own, their own interests. Oh, so wow. the, the, more, <laughs> the, the more you the, the more you get to sort of know them, or you know, we're, we're always we're always somewhere, we're always online somewhere talking about something, and you know, doing panels and everything. You know, it's really worth doing all that kind of homework and just finding out what commissioners are talking about and what and what they like. You know, there's there's three of us at Channel Four. We all like different things. There's certain things that I know if you sent certain genres to me, probably not going to be interested. And I'm quite vocal about that. So it's worth finding that stuff out. So you kind of go, okay, I'm not going to send this one to Lee. I'm going to send this one to Grant. I'm going to send this one to Caroline. You know, it's just work that stuff out. It's worth it. Um, it's a Sin was originally called Boys. How much does the title affect the creative process and who's in charge coming up with it, especially when it comes to such a personal story? Uh, well, the title was mine, really, um, wasn't it? And I don't, I don't know how much the title affects the... It was called Boys, then we changed it to It's a Sin, it's the same show. Um, so I'm not sure. I think you could like, be, get over, over superstitious about how much the title affects something. However, what a great change. I mean, accidentally, that's been I mean, our number one this week with, uh, the, with Ollie and Elton John uh, covering that. So you can, again, there's an awful lot of lucky things sparked with It's a Sin. We just hit lucky in all sorts of ways. And that's one of them. Do you feel like um, Nicola and Lee, do you feel like a better, like a name can help something sell better? Oh, or have yeah, you definitely. ever had something come to you where you're like, this is great, but the name actually sucks? Yeah. I, I've been involved in title changes before because people didn't understand what the title meant. Mm. But it didn't stop the programme getting commissioned. The titles changed after the programme was commissioned. So I think no commissioner I've ever met it would would say no because of a title. <laughs> what is this called? Yeah. <laughs> and, and also, you know, I don't mind admitting when Russell said I want to call it It's a Sin, I was the one I went, oh, I'm not sure about that. Oh, I, I, I think, I think, I think that's, oh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, Russell. I'm not sure. And I wasn't going to say. I was going to then watched an episode and then saw it come up in the break title and I was like, do you know what? It's perfect. I'm like, oh. <laughs> I, I, and I did email you. I was like, I was so wrong about this. Oh. So wrong. And now, of course, it's, you know, I can't imagine it being called anything else. So, you know, just yeah. so commissioners don't know but very much, really. No one does. No one does. Though. We're all. <laughs> and then you get to call the audience sinners. Like, there's just so much to <laughs> add. Yeah. It's so good. We've got another question from Catalina. Thanks, Catalina. Uh, it's for Nicola. Nicola, could you tell us what is the what is your favorite part of the work that you do? And uh, specifically, what was your favorite part of working on It's a Sin? Looks like we got the young EP out there. Oh no, is Nicola frozen? No, I, I just didn't hear the end of your sentence. I heard favorite thing about my job. Yes, what is, the, yes what is your favorite thing about the work that you do? And specifically, um, what was your favorite part of working on It's a Sin? So I'm very lucky in that I enjoy the whole process, but what I've always absolutely loved is scripts. 
So I, I consider myself as, as a glorified script editor in the best possible sense, which is still every decision I make as an executive producer is about what's what will work best for this script. So whether it's about employing the right director, producer, anyone, it's about how can we make the script better? How can we make the script as best as it can be? So for me, that it's it's getting a script each time, reading it and, be, and getting that thrill when you read a script. I mean, I'm not just saying this, but Russell's scripts are extraordinary to read because when he was talking about layout, <laughs> he manipulates you <laughs> as a reader. So you're <laughs> literally on the edge of a page and then you turn the page and, you get it's so clever. and it's just so, you feel privileged reading them. But, the, but then it's the process of getting them on screen that is so fantastic. With It's a Sin, you know, it was hard work. It, it's, you know, Russell scripts are very hard work. And I don't mean that in a rude way. I mean it in a way you have to be the best you can possibly be because he has more scene numbers than anyone else. You know, there are more characters than anyone else. His ambition is huge. You know that you can't shoot it in a small way. So mm. it just, it keeps you on edge and it keeps you going, uh, you know, to kind of, to be the best that you can be. I actually think actually putting together this cast was extraordinary. No, not yeah. putting together the cast, watching them as people become so close to each other and then put that on screen was, you felt privileged watching it. Yeah, they get on so well. When I met them at After Hours, I was like, I feel like you guys are best friends and I'm mad that I'm not invited. Yeah. <laughs> like I was and like, after out. watching the show, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> amazing can i ask you guys are you talking about reading a lot of scripts do you guys watch a lot of tv yes yeah yeah Ooh. there was we so much on last night last night there was a million things on innocent what do you like Pax. to watch russell i i watch just about every not every well now you can't watch every drama go literally last night i watched I watched the pact go out live and i taped innocent and mayor of east town was on, and i watched mayor of east town lunchtime today so it was a Monday nights are good. So if there's a if there's yeah. a drama on, I'll watch that. Yeah. I'm yeah. struggling to watch more than one. So I, I did the pact last night and I know that I'll catch up on. I'm, with Mary Beast Town, I'm waiting. And I don't know why I'm waiting, but some things I find it fit. also depends on how many scripts are coming in. I don't know if you've the same Lee, but if I've got lots of different projects with scripts delivering, I can't watch drama. It's like you're my head's full of story. Oh. And to try and invest in another story, it's really hard. And I and it's sad because that was my pleasure was watching television. But you've always got something filming. That, means, that must be all the time. No, it's scripts coming in. It's not filming. Um, when you're developing, because when you're filming, uh -huh. you, it, it's actually a relief to watch something else. When you've got like four or five different stories in front of you and you've got to really work on story, uh -huh. it's really hard to watch something else. Yeah, I have to say, because we're just, we're just locking stuff. I mean, the edit on something, something's in pre-production, so just looking, so sort of shooting script stage, and then we're at week two of something else that's shooting. And I must admit, at the moment, when I finish my day and I get in front of the TV, I'm currently on season eight of Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Because, uh -huh. I, because, 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 because when you've got that much going on, I sort of go, yes. I, yes. I, I, I just have to watch something that's not my uh -huh. genre, really. Uh -huh. um, so I'm watching uh -huh. a lot of Dorit and Lisa Vanderpump yes. arguing over yes. a dog. That's what I'm watching at the moment. Don't you do it, Lisa. <laughs> I tell you, I've I've literally started the first season of Real Housewives of Atlanta two days ago because I didn't watch it, and I'm just kind of like I need the dysfunction to not be me, I need it to be someone else. I love that. That's brilliant. Thank you for sharing. I have another question, a little statement, and then we'll get out of here. Um, last question from Eleanor Fusaro. Do you have any advice on writing great treatments for indies? Hmm. What do you mean? Do you mean for us to get them when we get great treatments? What makes it good to read? Do you think? Yeah, and um, I think this person is coming from the perspective of yeah, maybe outside of the mainstream. Um, oh, indie in that respect. It, it kind of I, I I personally I don't know about you, Lee, but I don't clarify what something is when I read it. It's whether it grabs me, whether the story is good, and whether I, I'm engaged by those characters. But you know, just like you can say, Russell was giving really practical advice, the way something looks is hugely important when you're delivering it to producers because they read so much. So it has to be really easy to read. So, you know, you have to be able to see the header, you have to be able to see who the characters are, you have to be led through the story. If you are given like a novel that's got no, no lines in between or, or very, very small writing, whatever it is, it's hard to read. And I need to be guided through it. It needs to look modern. Mm, yeah, I think, you, you know, it's like however dense you want your sort of pitch document to be, 
it's that it's that it's that front page it's that first page because you know we've got a lot we, we get pitched a lot of stuff so it's that what you want that one idea when you get to the big the end of that front page and you go oh okay that's interesting that's interesting that 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 that's a different voice approaching that subject that's a different point of view that's a it's an attitude i didn't expect um because i say this all the time i you know you, I, there's no story i wouldn't be interested in sort of you know commissioning or developing or anything like that it's all about how you're telling it and how you're approaching it and so mm. the way that front page that, that's that's what does that that's what you, that's what makes us remember it at the end of the day and go hmm, maybe that's the one I'll, I'll, I'll meet that person and do you get fed up with because i do a lot of mentoring so i read a lot of pictures and stuff and you get fed up with all the graphics here's the photographs here's I the font know. just I get know. to page yeah. one of the script it's like people spend so much time on that now whether that's from indie or it's from mainstream they think it's all about the graphic design of the jazzy treatment just get to page one of the script yeah oh, if, you're, if, 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 if you're going to meet with a production company and it's a sales thing fine put all the pictures yes. on you want but to be honest with you i'm gonna I'm, these days i'm reading it on my phone sometimes when we're out and about doing stuff so just give me the text i don't need i don't know in fact in fact when i get stuff with all the bells and whistles on it and all the pictures i always kind of think why did you need to do that yeah. and i usually ah. assume that maybe the document's not as good as it sounds terrible but and, all, and for god's sake check for typos yeah. when you read a lot of scripts typos feel like an insult and everyone says this, check for typos, and writers go, oh, yeah, 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 I'm so creative. Yeah, 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 like that. And it's like, check for bloody typos, because it feels like they're not bothered, they don't care about you. It's 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 amazing how bad it feels to read typos. And I guarantee there's one on page one. And I'll, I'll tell you one as well. I, I've, I've had stuff pitched to me where it's like, you know, uh, six-part detective thriller for Sky. <laughs> like, there you go. All right, so, so, so they rejected it, and now you're sending it to me. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think what we all, um, if you don't know, uh, if you guys are still studying, how you make people feel and how people feel about you is incredibly important in this business. Uh, <laughs> I'm only here because I made somebody smile once. So, <laughs> um, thank you guys so much for being here. And we have something come through, and it isn't a question, but a sweet note. So, I'm going to read it, and then we can all go along our merry way as you guys cook up how to get these scripts online so we can continue learning. Um, hi, this isn't a question, but I just wanted to say thank you for creating the show because my Nana's uncle passed away in the 80s because of AIDS and it reintroduced that convo to my family and conversations around the LGBT plus community and allowed me to happily come out as a lesbian. Oh. Um, also, a side note, doctor, uh, also side note, a doctor who practically shaped me growing up. Oh, oh, also side note, <laughs> Doctor Who <laughs> practically shaped me growing up. So thank you, Russell. Thank you. Oh, that's the sweetest. That's the sweetest. And I can say um, as a young queer person, the community really does appreciate this project. So thank you guys for making it happen and for bringing it to us. I feel like I'm going to cry now. That's a lot. I cry every time. Uh, every time. Yeah, every time. <laughs> honestly. Oh, my God. Thank you guys so much. Everyone at home, thank you for being a part of this. But I guess also mostly thank them. Uh, and have a good one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you.